as we learn how to create space between reaction and response, yeah. now we're saying, oh, if I just take this moment, I actually get to choose what my life's going to be and what, what my relationships are going to be. Yeah. I'm no longer a victim to them. I'm in charge. Hello. We've got uh, my good friend Terry Cole hopping on, which is going to be very exciting because who doesn't love Terry Cole? We're going to talk about communication. Communication being the most important skill you can develop. There she is. Hi. Down yeah. down. What's up? How you doing? I mean, I mean, we haven't had a chance to jam with everybody in a while. I know. This feels very exciting. I'm pumped. Communication, one of my faves, and I know one of your faves too. Yeah, and you know, I think for, if I was to do a census, a survey of a thousand people, and I said, what is the most important skill that you could develop? Like, what is the greatest predictor of your relationship outcomes? 982 would be like communication. Yep. I mean, ideally, I would imagine it would be that. The other 18 would be like maybe staying faithful, right? Like there'd be the, that reaction, which that's actually a very, that's a healthy option too. But the communication part, we know this. Like I conceptually, logically, intellectually understand that communication is essential to my own well-being, to my partnerships, to my family, to my friendships, to work. And yet, very few of us actually develop the skills to be a master of communication. And we don't even realize, like, we don't even recognize how impactful that is on our bodies. Like, to be a great communicator is liberating for the body, and to not be one is highly inflammatory to the body. Without a doubt. And I also think that we people, a lot of times, at least in my therapy practice, under, they, they overestimate how well they're communicating, and they underestimate how passive aggressive they're being. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the irony of the underestimation of passive aggression is not lost upon me. Indeed. But you so, know, we so often don't know other skills. You know, I, we witness our parents, how they communicate or the lack thereof. We witness how politics and hard sub subjects um, are not navigated. Like it's not modeled for us in the world, this, this beautiful ability to be able to take something like conflict and disagreement and actually make it so it deepens intimacy, make it right. so it actually deepens connection. That's a foreign thought. Like when I was, I think I was about 17 or 18. Um, this is a good little vulnerable moment for everybody. Mm -hmm. Huddle in. I uh, remember looking, I was dating a girl for like probably about two years in at this point. And I was of the belief like, you know what? We don't really need to talk about things. Like it'll work itself out. And I remember seeing a rose I had given her as an anniversary gift because who didn't do that back then? Um, I invite a little more creativity these days, but hey, we were doing the best with what we had. And I remember looking at the rose and it was dying. And I remember thinking kind of like our relationship. And you'd think that someone would be like, oh, I should probably engage in change. But no, I remember thinking it'll work itself out. It did work itself out. But I didn't actually try to generate something right. from that generated dialogue generate a vulnerable moment i just avoided conflict i was terrified of it and now i like not that i dive into it but i when i'm experiencing conflict with kylie now it's not something that threatens our relationship to me it's um an opportunity for deeper understanding for a deeper possibility yep. deeper you know with such a different way it, it why is... don't they teach us to be adults young <laughs> They don't, because when you think about how, what we really learned, so much of the communication and so much of the way that we teach it and the way we teach it together is about unlearning what we learned, right? Nobody, nobody taught, in, you know, you were not supposed to talk about many things in the family that I grew up in. There were all these forbidden emotions. There was all these conversations that were off the table. Like, no, and no one had to, I didn't get an inner office memo telling me what those things were. You just know as a kid, like, oh, no one's allowed to be angry or we're not allowed to talk about those things. So what, because therapeutically, all you can do is talk it out or act it out. And so mm. if we're not talking it out, trust me, we're acting it out. 
And that is the biggest problem that I see in my therapy practice is people acting it out because they don't have the words. Right. They haven't actually developed the language for the somatic experience for what's going on in their body. There hasn't been safety. I mean, it's interesting when someone can't access, we often think like, oh, I can't access anger or maybe my access to anger is too good because I can't access grief. I can't access vulnerability. So the only way I know how to communicate is by blowing up. Or when people, I think this, this is very foreign for people and they don't think of it often, is that we don't even, sometimes that we don't even know how to access joy, like possibility, potential, yeah. you know, and that language allows us to at least liberate what's being held onto. And I just see like how transformative that is for people physiologically. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden their, you know, aspects of their autoimmune start to disappear because they're starting to act, instead of being, and you think of autoimmune is really the body at war with itself. Like when we're not communicating, right. there is that same thing going on. It, no, no doubt. And, and Starlight Catcher just said, you know, it takes two. And yet, and, and that's totally true, but about meaning, if you want to have good communication, but you, your mind would be blown as to how much your life and your relationships can change when you commit to becoming a master communicator right? Like we lead and it's shocking to people when they start to learn right. how to do it differently, that people in their life start responding differently. So even if you have this story about the person that you're with, like they're a bad communicator or they don't want to talk about anything that's important or whatever the story is, when you focus on yourself, when you focus on what you um, can do, how you can express yourself in a way that's natural to you, not threatening, not starting fights, not punching people in the nose verbally, right? It doesn't have to be this, where people get so afraid if we're talking about communicating. A lot of times, Mark, in my therapy practice, people conflate communicating with confrontation. And it's like, right, yes, yes. Yeah, we're just gonna get into it and I'm just gonna, boom, we're just gonna be fighting. That's not what it is, which is why you and I have come together and we are actually doing, this is the first time that we are working together, working together. Yes, here's our live, but we are actually created a workshop for you guys that is this Sunday called Crushing, Crushing. Communication. So anyway, we're going to continue talking. We're going to answer your questions. Um, someone from my team or his team, somebody is going to put the link in there. Um, oh, just here yeah, do yeah, crushingcommunication.com. We can do it. Um, so why don't we talk about our top, what we think are the top blocks, and then you guys ask us your questions, and we will answer your questions about communication. There we go. So I just put it in. The, what you said about being able to, okay, there it's been. What you said about, because so often we see the it takes two, and I just want to touch on how important that is to acknowledge how much easier it can be when you have a receptive audience who wants to work through things. I've noticed in my own life, as I navigated healing defensiveness, which we can get into as one of the main blocks yeah. to yeah. great communication and intimacy. So this is a level of responsibility that goes like, hey, I actually was the problem a lot of the time because productive conversations couldn't happen because I was so busy defending my fragile self-worth. Mm -hmm. Like I was so afraid of not being enough that when my partner, insert any girlfriend I ever had, insert a teacher, a coach, yeah. the moment they gave me feedback that let's say 90% of the time, 95 was a positive intention for me to change and be better. I couldn't even hold that because I couldn't hold the idea that I let them down that I wasn't enough. But when I finally started to own my own shit, yeah. my life changed. And what I noticed is I ended up in conversations I'd never allowed myself to be in before because they never got to the place where all of a sudden they would say to me, hey, Mark, you know what? You were late. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, you want to talk about late? Let's do it. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, we, we can't. But what I noticed when I started to heal defensiveness through the things we're going to teach you in the workshop on Sunday, yeah. instead of hitting the ball back at them, I received it and I said, thank you. You're mm. right. Oh, but it's like eating a shit sandwich. It's mm -hmm. not fun. 
But what happened was I started to see all the value that I was getting from the relationships that I had been blocking. I was so afraid. Yeah. And um, I say that because what I noticed is that all my relationships transformed. My relationship with my mom, where I would say a lot of the defensiveness was learned through uh, some of that. She started to not be mm -hmm. defensive. She started to share with me and clear with me and be vulnerable with me. And I was like, she said to me last summer, I did something, I forget, I said something to her. And she said to me, hey, I just want to share with you that what you said really hurt my feelings. And I was like, wow, I'm so, thank you. It was like, it was like, <laughs> oh. and it, you know, over time, it probably started by me communicating and it took three months for there to be a bit of a difference. And then it took, but the trust was being built that I was safe to be communicated with. And oh man, the transformation in my relationships too, which defensiveness still rears its head, of course. So let's talk a bit about defensiveness. Why is this one of the greatest blocks to intimacy? And I'd love to see in the chat, hands up or give us a yes if you're a defender. And I say this <laughs> like hand up, yeah. I got two hands up. I'm a recovering <laughs> defender. <laughs> Well, let's, first of all, well, I love this quote from one of our mutual pals and someone who I love to death, Dr. Harriet Lerner, says, oh, defensiveness yes. is the arch enemy of connection and intimacy, but it's also the arch enemy of listening. Defensiveness is the arch enemy of listening. So when we are trying to effectively communicate or be heard or be seen accurately, when we put up that defense, I want you to think of it like a shield goes up, right? You're literally putting something up that goes between you and someone else. Another um, term, one of my favorite terms for defensiveness that I like when we respond defensively is from Sharon Ellison. And to be defensive is to react with a war mentality in a non-war issue. That one's so good. So, like that. Yeah. So, so true too. Oh God. Well, how threatened I'm feeling is what it's about. It's a tendency. What is, what is defensiveness? A tendency to be super sensitive to comments or criticism, to deny or refute them. I, I, I didn't even know what defensiveness was when I was younger. And I had a boss and I remember I, I, was, I was an assistant at a talent agency. And I did, I don't know what I did, but he was telling me that I did it wrong and how to do it. And I couldn't wait to tell him why I did it the way I did it. Well, I did it that way because Betty did it that way. And, and he was like, Terry, I don't care why you did it that way. And I don't appreciate your defensiveness. It's not very professional. <gasps> what? I was like, <laughs> run to the bathroom immediately, <laughs> cry hysterically. But it changed my life. Because I literally, and I was 24 mm. at the time, I didn't even know that's what being defensive was. And what ended up happening when I really worked on my defensiveness, similar to what you're saying, Mark, is that I learned so much. And like now, so decades later, I'm so into constructive criticism, obviously only from trusted sources and not from right. everyone in the world, but I'm always coming to my community and asking them, what, are they, what do they need? What do they want? If you take a course with me, you get an anonymous survey that's like, what could have been better? Please tell me. And it, I'm not defensive, I'm grateful. And so I think that the shift mm -hmm. that happens when we're able to let it in, as you were saying, is that we, we deepen the intimacy in our lives, but the real key is we have to discern because when we're defensive, we're into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and we are not being discerning where we feel threatened, but the way our body is reacting, it's like a saber-toothed tiger, is yeah. like right behind there. And part of this, moving away from is we have to be really discerning about yes i'm feeling threatened but actually i'm not in mortal right. danger like my ego might feel like it's in mortal danger but in real life i'm actually not and i think that that's one thing that we can really step into is making that distinction of the difference between the two yeah being able to create that space between you know that automatic trigger yeah and actually choosing you know what is that uh i don't know who broke this down but when i heard it i was like i, I want that to be me but where you say like taking responsibility the ability to respond you know the responsibility yeah. like that is such a profound way of simply thinking of 
to be able to choose how you're going to take in information that doesn't feel good. That mm -hmm. when, uh, I think it is Byron Katie who said, you can't have war with one person. So as soon as one person sets their arms down, there is no longer a war. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know that, I mean, how apropos is that to life in general? But it's like, when we think about that in intimate relationship, I think of the value that comes from our responses and our reactions in especially our intimate relationships. Like workplace, yes, I used to see that in teams. I'd see that a lot. I see that when people are getting feedback. And I love how you prefaced trusted sources. A person who has a cat profile picture on Instagram is not a trusted source, people. And like the person who is vindictive and controlling and not capable, who's abusive, who doesn't know how to use their language in a loving way, yeah. are not trusted sources. Correct. And so like that being able to, as we learn how to create space between reaction and response, yeah. now we're saying, oh, if I just take this moment, I actually get to choose what my life's going to be and what what my relationships are going to be. Yeah. I'm no longer a victim to them. I'm in charge. Yeah. And then secondly, we start to develop because there's space there that is creating discernment. We now develop discernment with what is a trusted source because what beautifully ha happens that is the how you do one thing is how you do everything is that you become a trusted source for yourself in the moments of space that now you're able to differentiate and see if someone else is a trusted source too. And that, that's profound. And when, when you said like, you don't need to, two's great, but you don't need to, you need one. And you know that saying like, you wanna heal the world, heal yourself, because that sends ripple effects to every system that you're involved in. And if you're a leader, which you are a leader, whether you're in a leadership position at right. work or at home, you're a leader and, and then you get to decide what legacy do you want to leave? What imprint do you want to leave? What relationships do you want to create? These are all so profoundly important. And if that's not enough, the icing on the cake is the greatest predictor of your health at age 80 is not your cholesterol, your blood no. pressure, any of those things. It's the quality of your relationships <laughs> at age 50 yep. and not romantic. So you don't have to be in a romantic nope. relationship. It's all your relationship, your life. If any of this is resonating, sign up for a workshop. If you can't make it live, you'll get a copy of the recording, all the worksheets, you'll get everything. And it will profoundly change your life. Like it will, if you do the things that you're invited to do, you will profoundly change your life. That's it. It's, it's so, it's so simple. And yet the skills will be presented and set out for you very simply how to do it. Absolutely. And here's the thing I that you can do that. No, I love it though, because everything you said is absolutely true. And how you, you how do you sign up for it? Go to crushingcommunication.com. Easy breezy. The the shift that you can make in your life right now for all of you guys who are here is this can be a moment, a power pivot, where you decide that you're going to learn this skill and you're going to face this. Right, because part of it is nobody taught you. So don't feel bad about not knowing. If you don't love confrontation, welcome to being a human being. Most normal people don't. Right. It's not about confrontation. It's about the more readily you communicate effectively. First of all, the less confrontation you end up having because you're on the same page with people. You're letting people know um, how you feel, what you want, what's working, what's not working. But the bottom line is that you are the one you've been waiting for. You are the one. So if you decide you're going to take the leap, jump in with us, spend three hours with us on Sunday, learning this skill set, you have the everything that that goes along with it forever, right? You can revisit this, the, the PDF, the workbook that we have for you. That can be the beginning of the next part of your life. Because I want you to get honest with yourself about how frustrated do you feel? Do you feel unseen? Do you feel unheard? Do you feel marginalized in some way. The thing for me that was so painful when I was younger about being a crappy communicator, being passive aggressive, you know, being withdrawn in anger. And these are all things we talk about in the workshop, like the most common things that we do, especially with passive aggressive stuff, the existential loneliness mm. that comes along with being not accurately understood was 
literally and it became intolerable in my life which is what sort of drove me to therapy in my early 20s and i stayed till now like i'm still there it's been decades like i love it it's a gift i give myself but the need to be seen but not just seen seen accurately it's i can't mark knows i can't have you maybe understand me right i i need to know that you really my poor husband but whatever this is this is what he's <laughs> And that's what you get is being uniquely and specifically understood when you have the skills to communicate effectively and readily. And that's what we want, you know? Yeah, that, that ability to, to feel understood, to communicate the words that you want to get across, the, the experience you're having. And also what a gift it is to maybe for the first time actually provide that for someone else. Like, you know, that ability to actually listen, hear, and empathize with someone else. Um, and yes, the recording will be available if you cannot make Sunday. And if you can make Sunday, you'll get a copy of everything too. So sign up because you're going to become a communication master and it's going to change your life. And uh, whether you can make it or not, you're going to get all the info. So yes. Hold on, Does anyone someone, have any other questions? There was yeah, another sorry, on, question that Anna had, so I wanted to get back to that. We're talking about defensiveness. How, so let's flip it. What happens when you're dealing with someone who's really defensive? When you are, the second you start to mention something, the person immediately gets their back up and says, ah, you know, like, I can't deal with you or whatever the thing is. So I'll give you my two cents, and, or do you want to weigh in first? Go ahead. Well, my thought is this, when someone is really defensive, first I try to understand them, right? In, in my mind, we, we know the players in our life, right? So it shouldn't surprise you. Your super defensive sister getting defensive when you criticize her should not be surprising because you've had this experience a million times, right? right? So first and foremost, I always like to have the conversation with someone when they're not being defensive, right? It never, ever is going anywhere. When they're already <laughs> activated, forget it. You might as well yeah, just go out to lunch, no. have sex, do yeah. something, whatever you're doing. But it's, it's not going to go anywhere if you're already in that situation. My feeling is wait until you just had a lovely meal. Maybe you just made out. Whatever it is that you did, if it's your partner, or maybe if it's your sister, you guys just did, went shopping, had lunch. And you can say, hey, um, I've noticed that there are a lot of times when I try to talk to you, that it's hard because you get defensive and you get mad really quick. And what I'm seeing is that it makes me not want to tell you things that are important to me. And it's bumming me out so much because I love you and you're my close person and I don't want to not tell you things. So can we talk about this? Can we, is there a way that, and, and see what they say. When they're not feeling defensive, they may go, "Ugh, I know I do that. I hate that. But once I start, I can't stop. Like, we can have real conversations about these things without having the exact answer, right? We don't need the exact answer, but this is what communication is about. We get to the answer. You, right now, people are asking, how do you sign up? Go to crushingcommunication.com. Um, anyway, so that, that's my two cents on a possibility of dealing with someone who's defensive. Now, when it's, that's what I would do if it was someone who is important to me, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not, I'm not all about the bet. If someone is not important to me and they're super defensive, I'm probably not spending a lot of time worrying. Exactly. I'm not, I'm not that worried about them. I, I'm like, it's not pleasant to talk to someone if I can't talk to them. So for me, that probably is kind of a warning sign that maybe stepping back is the way to go in that relationship for me. What you, yeah, I'm, I just see that comment. What if they're defensive? You what about if they're defensiveness and you they say it's because you're actually too sensitive or you overthink things that it's your perception that's interesting because that's defensiveness like that's the irony <laughs> totally. of that and you know it listen it's with someone who's defensive it's not often going to happen in the first conversation we're going to go through we're going to give you scripts on sunday you're going to get scripts in the workshop you're going to get different examples i'll give you one now what I like to preface anytime I'm giving someone feedback is that what my intention for the relationship is. So I'll say, hey, look, like I'm really committed to transparency, to openness, to respect. And um, here has been here was my experience. And this is what I would need from you in order to create this. Is there anything you need from me 
Mm. And what I find is that in my experience thus far, because it's with people who are important in my life, not just a random person like with a cat picture. But what I find is that when you practice your intention for the relationship in that you're actually living the things you just said, anyone who wants to generate a positive relationship with you can't like they're unable to be able to be like, well, that was ill intended. Yeah. You know? Yep. So with that said, I find that the energy that lives in defensiveness needs to dissipate a bit over time because it is really the lack of capacity to hold shame and that, that we don't want to touch our shame. So mm -hmm. instead we get reactive. Right. So that also, if it's a couple, one thing that can really work well is creating a word. And Terry and her husband have a really beautiful process that they do, which we'll talk about on Sunday. Mm -hmm. But to say like, hey, you know, right now, this is going somewhere that I actually can't participate in because I love us too much. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, is if you've been in a relationship for six months, 20 years, you got to think that every time you do the dance the same way, there's the expectation that the dance will be the same way yeah. and Harriet Lerner who Terry mentioned earlier she has the book the dance of intimacy and the dance of anger and they talk about this that the moment you shift how you're showing up to the very normal cha-cha and now all of a sudden you're like let's do the two-step which let's call that healthy communication the other person is like what the fuck are you doing like <laughs> why are your feet over there and you're like but it's it's fun and it feels lighter and they're like, no, no, I know the cha-cha. So here, I'm going to cha-cha yeah. you. And that, that is like the, the trying to get us back into the cycle. So it doesn't always happen in the first. It often doesn't. But over time, there's a different trust that's built within the connection. And so we're going to teach you how to do all of these things. Again, just go to crushingcommunication.com. You'll get scripts. You'll get the worksheets. If you can't make it on Sunday, which what a beautiful time for a church of communication. Correct. If you can't make it, you'll get a copy of the recording. I love that. Um, what I want to say about the Harriet Lerner stuff that you said is she's so great about the way that she frames it as a dance, which I've used in my, my work forever, definitely influenced by her work. And that part of what we're going to be teaching you on Sunday is as you start to change, the people in your life notice. So how can you sort of acknowledge the change without, like they're going to be a little resistant. How can we make the people in our life get that we're changing, but it doesn't have to be terrible. And with defensive people, I feel like the, the more, the better communicator you are, the easier it is to approach someone who has been defensive in the past and have them be less so. So I love what Mark, you said before about approaching the conversation with your intention. And I always say that with boundaries or with a boundary request or with effective communication, we can always start with love. Like we can always start with sweetness, not as a manipulation technique, as a truth. So we're reminding the person like, hey, you're super important to me. This relationship is a priority for me. I really love you. And I want to make a simple request that whatever, whatever the thing is. So again, I think that how one person changes can change everything in a relationship and certainly can change everything in your life. Beautiful. I totally agree. All right. Well, I guess on that note, everybody, we love you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, crushingcommunication.com. Go sign up. You're going to become, you're going to be in the top 0.11111% of communicators on the planet. And that's what actually changes our planet. Indeed. So let's do it. We need it. I'll see you guys there 